look outside or just look at a picture of our planet from space, you see it. That deep, endless blue. Water. Oceans cover most of our world. We swim in it, drink it, live by it. It feels like the most permanent thing there is. But it wasn't always here. Earth wasn't born blue, it was born red and black, a glowing ball of molten rock. So, where did all this water come from? How do you go from a hellish, fiery rock to a world with oceans? It's one of the biggest questions we can ask about our home, and the answer is a story that starts over four and a half billion years ago. It's a story about violence, heat, and a very, very long rain. It's also a story about visitors from deep space. Let's go back to the beginning, not just of Earth, but of the solar system. There was no sun, no planets. Just a huge spinning cloud of gas and dust. Gravity started pulling this cloud together. Mo most of it fell to the center, got incredibly hot and dense and ignited. That was the birth of our sun. Um, what was left over was a spinning disk of dust and rock and ice. Little bits of this stuff started sticking together. Think of dust bunnies under your bed, but on a cosmic scale. Tiny grains became pebbles. Pebbles became rocks. Rocks smashed into each other and stuck, becoming bigger rocks. This process is called accretion. It's messy and chaotic. These growing clumps called planetesimals kept colliding and merging. Over millions of years, they grew into the planets we know today. Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars. But there was a problem. A location problem. The young sun was blazing hot. In the inner solar system where Earth was forming, it was too hot for water to exist as ice. Any ice would have been vaporized and blown away by the solar wind. This creates a sort of frost line in the solar system. Inside the line, it's rocky and dry. Outside the line, it's cold enough for water, methane, and ammonia to freeze into ice. That's why the outer planets, like Jupiter and Saturn, are gas and ice giants. They formed out there in the cold. So Earth formed in the hot, dry zone. It should have been a desert world, a bone-dry rock. Yet, here we are on a water world. This is the central mystery. If Earth wasn't built with water, how did the water get here? There are two main ideas. One is that the water came from the inside out. The other is that it was delivered from the outside in. For a long time, scientists argued about which one was right. The truth, as it often is, seems to be a bit of both. But let's look at each story separately. First, the inside-out story. This is the idea that Earth had its water from the very beginning. It was just hidden. Remember those little rocks and dust grains that built the planet? Not all of them were perfectly dry. Even in the hot inner solar system, some minerals can trap water molecules within their crystal structure. They're not wet to the touch, like a sponge. They're more like a salt shaker that has absorbed humidity from the air. The water is locked inside the mineral itself. These are called hydrated minerals. So as Earth was forming, it was built from this stuff. A planet made of rock that had water baked right into it. But the early Earth was a terrible place. It was a sea of magma. The constant collisions from accretion generated incredible heat. On top of that, radioactive elements deep inside the planet were decaying, releasing even more heat. The entire planet, or at least its outer layers, was molten. During this molten phase, the planet started to sort itself out. Heavier stuff, like iron and nickel, sank toward the center. This formed Earth's core. Slighter materials, the uh, silicates and other rocks, floated toward the surface. This process is called differentiation. It's why Earth has a dense iron core, a rocky mantle, and a lighter crust. And what about the water trapped in those minerals? As the rocks melted in this planetary furnace, the water was released. It didn't become liquid water. It was far too hot for that. It became steam, water vapor. This steam, along with other gases like carbon dioxide, nitrogen, and sulfur compounds, was trapped in the magma. Whole Earth was like a giant cosmic pressure cooker. Uh, as this molten rock churned and circulated, some of it rose to the surface. As volcanoes began to erupt constantly. And when they erupted, they didn't just spew lava. They spewed gas a process called outgassing. All those gases that were dissolved in the magma, including that huge amount of water vapor, were released into the sky. So imagine it, a young Earth covered in a global ocean of magma under a sky choked with thick black clouds. But these clouds weren't made of water like our clouds today. They were a toxic mix of carbon dioxide, sulfur, and superheated steam. The atmosphere was thick, crushing. The pressure would have been immense, maybe hundreds of times what it is today and it was hot. The surface temperature was well over a thousand degrees. Any water that fell would have instantly boiled back into steam. 
This went on for a very long time, millions and millions of years, a constant cycle of volcanic outgassing creating a massive steam-filled atmosphere. The planet was essentially sweating out its own water. This steam in the atmosphere acted like a thick blanket, trapping heat and keeping the planet molten. It was a runaway greenhouse effect, but slowly, things started to change. The cosmic bombardment, the constant rain of asteroids and planetesimals that kept the planet hot, started to die down. The biggest impacts became less frequent, the radioactive elements inside the Earth decayed and produced less heat. The planet finally had a chance to cool. As the surface cooled, it began to solidify. The magma ocean turned into a crust of black, volcanic rock. It was still incredibly hot, but it was solid. The heat from the surface wasn't enough to keep the atmosphere in a permanent state of boiling. The atmosphere itself started to cool, and then a tipping point was reached. The temperature in the upper atmosphere dropped just enough. That superheated steam, which had been building up for millions of years, finally started to condense into liquid water droplets. And it started to rain. This wasn't a normal rainstorm, it was a deluge on a planetary scale. Maybe the most violent, long-lasting rainfall in the history of the universe. It rained for thousands of years, maybe even millions. Hot, acidic rain fell from a thick, dark sky onto a world of black, volcanic rock. At first, the ground was still so hot that the rain would have sizzled and boiled the second it hit the surface, turning back into steam and rising again. But the rain was relentless. It kept falling, and the act of evaporation itself is a cooling process. The constant rain slowly, steadily cooled the crust. Eventually, the ground cooled enough that the water could stay liquid. It started to form puddles. The puddles grew into ponds. The ponds became lakes. The lakes became seas. The rain kept falling, and the water levels rose. It filled the lowest lying areas first, the massive craters and basins left over from the Age of Impacts. Over an immense stretch of time, these basins filled and connected. The first oceans were born. They weren't the blue, salty oceans we know. They were probably hot, acidic, and full of dissolved minerals, especially iron, which might have made them appear greenish. But they were oceans, liquid water covering much of the planet. All of it in this story came from inside the Earth itself. It was there all along, just waiting to be released. That, that's a pretty compelling story. It makes a lot of sense. But is it the whole story? Some scientists looked at the numbers and felt something was missing. Could outgassing alone really account for the sheer volume of water we have today? Earth's oceans are vast. They contain about 320 million cubic miles of water. It's an almost unimaginable amount. Maybe Earth had some help from the outside. This brings us to the second main idea, the outside-in story. This is the theory of cosmic delivery. The water wasn't baked in, it was brought here. The delivery trucks were comets and asteroids. Let's go back to that frost line in the early solar system. Beyond that line, in the outer reaches where it was cold, vast amounts of water ice existed. This ice got incorporated into the objects that formed there. Comets, for example. We often call them dirty snowballs. They are essentially clumps of ice, dust, and frozen gases. They are time capsules from the formation of the solar system, and they are loaded with water. Asteroids, too. We tend to think of asteroids as just dry rocks, but that's not always true. Especially the ones that formed in the outer parts of the asteroid belt near the frost line. Um, a certain class of asteroid called carbonaceous chondrites can be surprisingly rich in water. Again, it's not liquid water. It's locked away inside their mineral structures just like in the Inside Out theory. Some of these asteroids can be up to 20% water by weight, so the water was out there. The question is, how did it get to Earth? The early solar system was a chaotic place. It was like a game of cosmic billiards. The giant planets Jupiter and Saturn were migrating around. Their immense gravity kicked objects out of their stable orbits, flinging them all over the place. Comets from the deep freeze of the outer solar system were sent hurtling inwards. Asteroids from the asteroid belt were knocked onto paths that crossed Earth's orbit. This led to a period we call the Late Heavy Bombardment. It happened about 4.1 to 3.8 billion years ago. For hundreds of millions of years, the inner planets, including Earth, were pummeled by a relentless barrage of comets and asteroids. The Moon's cratered surface is a lasting scar from this violent era. Earth was hit even harder because it's a bigger target with stronger gravity. And every time one of these icy comets or water-rich asteroids slammed into the Earth, it was a delivery, an impact, an explosion, and a splash of water. The impact itself would have vaporized the water, sending it into the atmosphere as steam. 
but once it was in the atmosphere, it would eventually cool, condense, and rain down, adding to the water that was already here. Imagine it. Millions of these impacts over millions of years, each one a small deposit. But they add up. It's like filling a swimming pool with a garden hose. It takes a long time, but eventually, it gets full. This theory suggests that Earth's oceans are the accumulated result of countless cosmic collisions. Our water is alien. It came from space. For a long time, these two theories were seen as competitors. Was our water homegrown, or was it imported? To figure it out, we needed a way to trace the water's origin. We needed a fingerprint. And we found one. It's called deuterium. Most water, H2O, is made of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. But hydrogen has a heavier sibling, an isotope called deuterium. It's a hydrogen atom with an extra neutron in its nucleus. It behaves just like hydrogen. It can form water just like hydrogen, but it's slightly heavier. This heavy water exists everywhere, mixed in with normal water. The key is the ratio. The ratio of deuterium to regular hydrogen, the DH ratio, varies depending on where in the solar system you are. Things that form in colder, more distant regions tend to have a higher DH ratio than things that form closer to the sun. So, we have a chemical fingerprint. All we had to do was measure the DH ratio of Earth's oceans and compare it to the DH ratio of our potential water sources, comets, and asteroids. The first measurements were a bit of a shock. Scientists pointed telescopes at comets and analyzed the light from their tails. The comets they looked at had a DH ratio that was much higher than Earth's oceans. Some had nearly double the amount of heavy water. If these comets were the primary source of our oceans, then our oceans should have that same high ratio. But they don't. This was a big blow to the comet delivery theory. It seemed like comets couldn't be the answer. But then we started looking at asteroids. We are lucky enough to have pieces of asteroids that have fallen to Earth as meteorites. When we analyzed the water trapped inside those carbonaceous chondrites, the water-rich asteroids from the outer belt, we found a stunning match. Their DH ratio was almost exactly the same as the water in Earth's oceans. This was a huge piece of the puzzle. It strongly suggested that these asteroids, not comets, were the primary source of our externally delivered water. The story got even more interesting recently. The European Space Agency's Rosetta mission actually orbited and landed on a comet called 67P. It was an incredible achievement, and it gave us our best measurements yet of a comet's water. Um, it turns out this comet's water was also very different from Earth's, with a much higher DH ratio. This seemed to confirm that comets weren't the main source, but science is never that simple. We've since measured other comets, and we found that some of them, particularly a family of comets that originate from a region called the Kuiper Belt, where Pluto is, do have a DH ratio that is a closer match to Earth's. So, the picture is getting a bit more complicated. So, where does that leave us? What is the real story of how Earth got its oceans? Today, most scientists agree that it wasn't an either-or situation. It was both. The most likely scenario is a combination of the inside-out and outside-in models. Um, the story probably starts with the inside-out process. Earth formed with a significant amount of water already baked into its rocks. As the planet heated up and volcanoes spewed gas for millions of years, this created the first atmosphere and delivered a substantial amount of water to the surface. This probably gave Earth its first oceans. It was the foundation. This water coming from the rocks that formed Earth would have had a specific DH ratio. But it probably wasn't enough to account for all the water we see. Then came the late heavy bombardment. For hundreds of millions of years, water-rich asteroids knocked from their orbits in the outer asteroid belt, rained down on our planet. Each impact added more water to the system, and since the DH ratio of these asteroids is such a good match for our oceans, they are considered the primary contributor of the imported water. They topped up the planet's water supply, comets likely played a role too, they undoubtedly hit the Earth and delivered water. But um, they were probably a minor contributor compared to the asteroids. Maybe they account for 10% of the water, maybe less. Their mismatched DH ratio suggests they couldn't have been the main source. So, the modern picture is a hybrid one. The Earth got a head start with its own internal water, released through volcanism. Then, a massive delivery from space, mostly via asteroids, gave us the vast, deep oceans we have today. Uh, it's, it's a beautiful synthesis of two big ideas. Our water has a dual origin. It is both native to this world and a gift from the cosmos. The water in your glass is billions of years old. Some of its molecules were trapped in rocks deep inside the molten Earth. Other molecules traveled for eons through the cold vacuum of space, locked inside an asteroid, before a violent collision brought them here. And the arrival of this water changed everything. It's the reason our planet is not like Mars or Venus. Well, Venus suffered a runaway greenhouse effect, and any water it had boiled away into space. So Mars grew cold and lost its atmosphere, and its water froze or was stripped away. Earth was in the Goldilocks zone. 
not too hot, not too cold, just right for liquid water to exist on its surface. And the oceans didn't just sit there, they began to shape the planet, they absorbed huge amounts of carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, helping to regulate the climate and preventing Earth from overheating like Venus. The water cycle began evaporation, condensation, rain. This eroded the rocks, carrying minerals and salt into the sea, creating the salty oceans we know. The moon's gravity pulled on these oceans, creating tides that washed back and forth over the shorelines. But the most important thing the oceans did was provide a stage for the next great chapter in Earth's story. Life. Life as we know it needs a liquid, a medium where complex molecules can float around, meet, and interact. The early oceans were a perfect chemical soup. They were warm, full of dissolved minerals from the volcanic rocks, and chemicals delivered by comets and asteroids. They were protected from the harsh ultraviolet radiation of the young sun. Somewhere in those ancient greenish seas, perhaps around a deep sea volcanic vent or in a shallow tidal pool, something incredible happened. Non-living chemicals organized themselves into the first simple self-replicating cells. Life began. For billions of years, life existed only in the oceans. It evolved and diversified in that aquatic nursery. The oceans kept the planet's climate stable enough for life to get a foothold and thrive. Without the oceans, it's almost certain that none of us would be here. So when you stand on a beach and look out at the water, you're looking at our planet's lifeblood. You're looking at a story of planetary formation, of volcanic fury, and of a cosmic bombardment. You're seeing the result of water that was both squeezed from the rocks beneath your feet and carried here on spaceships of rock and ice from the outer edges of the solar system. The question of where our oceans came from is not just a geological one, it's an existential one. It's the story of what makes our world special, it's the story of how a barren rock became a living, breathing blue planet. And we are still piecing that story together, one meteorite, one comet, and one rock sample at a time. The water that connects everything on Earth also connects us to the very beginning of our solar system. You know, it's the most ordinary substance in our lives, and it has the most extraordinary story of all.